And I'll get you to turn with me now in your Bibles to the second half of Philippians chapter 3. This morning we're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 3 from verse 17 up to and including verse 1. Paul writes, Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk, as you have us for a pattern. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Therefore, my beloved and longed-for brethren, my joy and my crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. Let's pray. Lord, it is a privilege to come this morning to hear from your word. Holy Spirit, please be with me and lead me as I'm preaching. Please be with everyone in the audience, and I pray that you can continue to work in us for your glory. Amen. So as we look at this chapter, you'll recall from verses 1 to 11, it was looking back. I found a great little summary which simply says Paul was looking at his past and he was the accountant. Remember, all the things as a righteous, upright Jew, he did. And then when he became a Christian, he realised that all of it was useless. It was trash. With, with regards to having faith in Jesus, all the other works of the law were useless. So he counted it all for loss. So he counts, as it says there, new values. Last week, we looked at Paul's present life. He's talking about his current walk or his sanctification. He talked about being an athlete that was straining and pressing towards the goal, the goal of Christ-likeness. And he said, I'm not perfect. And he said it again, I'm not perfect. He says, I have not obtained. But this is the life of a Christian that we are striving. As the Holy Spirit works in us, we move further and further away from our sinful self and closer to Jesus. We know, of course, we will never obtain that until the day he does come. But there was another helpful overview. You recall that the Christian life is a life of dissatisfaction, not resting on the past uh, wins or not resting on the past laurels of the Christian life, but always wanting to be better in ourselves. And that, of course, that doesn't come from ourselves. That comes from the work of God. There's devotion that as Christians, we have one thing. As a preacher, my whole emphasis is preaching Christ and him crucified. As Christians, we focus on Jesus. We have a direction. He says, remember, forgetting what was behind, I look forward. Forgetting what lies behind, he focuses forward to the prize. He was determined. A runner is determined in what they're doing. And they are disciplined. You recall that I talked about how someone training for the Olympics, they don't just rock up on the starting line and say, righto, let's get into this. No, they train and they work and they work hard. So we've had the past, we've had the justification, we've got the current life, the sanctification, and then Paul looks to the future. He's looking forward, and really verses 17 to 21, he compares those that think about earthly things, and he says, no, 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 as Christians, our citizenship is in heaven. So he talks about being an alien and a stranger. Just like the Jews were aliens and strangers in the promised land, they were different from the people around them, so us Christians must be different. We are to be in the world, we can't shrink away from it, but we shouldn't be of the world. And so Paul, as it says, he has a new vision. He's talking about his citizenship. And this is so important. We need to operate our lives within the light of eternity. Because we've got 50, 60, 70 years, some of us 90 years as a maximum, but that's nothing compared to eternity. You can't even fathom the difference. But when we think about this life compared with the next... You just can't compare it. And so Paul, this is what he's doing. He's calling his readers to remember who they are. You recall, this is a letter written to fellow Christians. This is a letter that is edifying for them, and it's instructing and edifying for us as well. So he starts. He's talking about himself again. He says, brethren, so fellow brothers and sisters, join in my following my example, and, not, and note those who so walk, as you have us for a pattern. Now, what I found interesting about this whole COVID-19 thing is the way it's changed everything. I've got a mate who works in the Brisbane CBD, and he's been doing a lot of work from home. 
He's been saving a bucket load of money. He doesn't have to go from Cooparoo all the way into the city. He's saving money on transport. I heard recently that obviously when people go on the bus and they go into the city for work, they go to local cafes and shops, but instead people are working from home. The local cafes and shops are doing better. Being at home has changed the way we do things. People are seeing the value in, our own, in their own backyard. There was a joke about how Bunnings is incredibly busy because suddenly everyone's got time on their hands. They walk outside and go, oh, I better sort this. There's, I've got to sort my lawn. I've got to do all these things. Even from the point of view of gospel outreach, there's a, a group I follow on Facebook, Operation 513. They normally go in the, the streets and they ask people, they, they talk to them about the gospel, they plead with them with their need for salvation. Normally they'd go out, but during the pandemic, they've been doing it online. They found an app when you can go and you can talk to anybody around the world and they say to them, hey, do you ever think about death? Do you consider yourself a good person? And they have these dialogues right from their home. And it's great. There's been a lot of good that's come out of this in the way we think about things. Churches are doing things differently. As a result, we've now changed. We're obviously facing this way. We're spread out a bit. We've been recording and putting the messages online, which has been great because it's reaching more people. And it's been really good. It was really hard to be away for 25 weeks, but suddenly together, I think we're really appreciating what we didn't have. But the reality is that for all the good things, there's also some things to be cautious of because the scripture says that we are to gather together. It says that we shouldn't neglect the gathering together. And this is why we're here this morning. Um, and there are some that can't gather through illness, through lack of transport. And I'm not talking about those, but sadly, I've seen, and a lot of Baptist churches are talking about that, there are those that could come back to church, but they don't out of sheer convenience because it's all up online. It's not that they can't come, it's that they won't come to church. And that's really a topic for another side. But I'm bringing this up because Paul is saying right there, he's talking to people that know him. He's saying, brethren, follow my example. We come to church to praise God and to encourage one another. As a solo rural pastor, I take very seriously the call and the proverb in Proverbs 27, 17. As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friends. One of the great joys of church is you come and you talk to one another and you share your, your burdens with each other for prayer. You can be encouraged by someone. You can be um, instructed as well. And this is what the Christian life looks like. That talks about that in the original sense of two blades being banged together and they would sharpen each other, as it says. But as Christians, we need to be coming together. We need to look at the pattern and the model of other believers to be encouraged by. Look for those more mature in the faith. I'm not talking about age, I'm talking about those mature in the faith. In Titus chapter 2, it talks a lot about that. It talks about younger Christians and younger men looking to older men and younger women looking to older women and, and vice versa. So Paul is really framing this. He's saying, imitate me, join me in imitating him. And of course, this isn't an egotistical thing. He's not saying, hey, I'm so great, look at me. But he's saying, look at my walk, join me in imitating my, uh, my pursuit for Christ. The ESV Bible noted that said that Paul's intent is not for the Philippians to focus on him per se, but rather for them to join him in humble, radical dependence on Christ. And not just him, he says others as well, others who do so. No doubt he's talking about Timothy. Remember, he, he was writing this letter and he mentioned Timothy. Epaphroditus, who gave them this letter, you, remember, you recall the Philippian church sent him to Paul to minister and he got sent back. So he's saying, look, there is numerous people you need to pattern your life on. And I read this and it's a, another reminder of why we need to gather together. We're doing so, we're doing so safely, but as Christians, we can't neglect our other people. It's not a solo sport, as I've said a number of times. The reality is who we hang out with and who we, um, does count. We should also hang with non-Christians, of course. We shouldn't just stay in our holy huddle. But we come to church and we make company with those that can encourage us, strengthen us. As it says in 1 Corinthians 15.33, Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. So Paul is calling them to model and to look after him. And then he says, For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. So he's kind of gone, okay, this is what you should do, pattern it on people like me and others. And then he's about to say, here are the people you don't want to follow. Here are the people that have disrupted everything. And then he is weeping as a result. He said he's warned them often. 
And this is what he does. Sometimes Paul directly calls out uh, someone that's, that's false. Sometimes he calls out a teaching or a group of people, as the whole letter of Galatians is, with those who added law to the gospel. But he's saying, look, you've got to be careful. And he says it as weeping. And I was looking at that because I was thinking, why is he weeping? He knows the damage that's done to those that take and distort the gospel, that add works to the gospel. He knows the damage that's done, not only the reputation and the work of Jesus, plus the damage that's done in people's lives. And I can sympathise with Paul, except I confess I don't weep, I get angry. And I pray it's a righteous anger, and I think it starts as righteous, and if I let it dwell on it too much, it turns to unrighteous. But it makes me angry when I see people who take the gospel and they change it for their own benefit. You may have seen it as well, but I've met many good people. And I say good in the worldly terms, you know, really good people. One guy in particular I knew who was a great father, loved his kids, talked to him about stuff in the church and he didn't want to have anything to do with it. He had a bad experience once and for him that was it. He didn't want to take his kids to church. He hated having chaplains in the school, everything. Sadly, one bad instance, it's kind of like when a kid eats a fish bone and they choke on it and then they don't touch fish for, for 10 years. One bad thing can throw people off. And I think this is why, in part, Paul is weeping, because he knows the damage that's done. And this is happening today. We know that there is the gospel and others add to the gospel. Or they use the pulpit as a means to simply gain more money. Sow a seed and do this and you're guaranteed to be healed. And they, they reduce Jesus to no more than a simple genie. Suddenly he didn't die on the cross so that you could be saved from your sins. No, he died so you could have your best life now. It doesn't work, and I can see why Paul is weeping. And he's not mincing his words, because he calls them the enemy, the enemy of the cross of Christ. He, and he goes on to say, well, well, why? He expands a bit in verse 19. He says, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. And that didn't make a, any sense to me until I actually looked at it properly. Whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. We are to set our minds on heavenly things. He says this is what people do. They focus on earthly things. He calls them out on the damage they've done. Now, I was reading this and I was thinking, okay, who is it, Paul? Who are you talking about? And all the commentaries and all the studies I read, they said it could either be two groups. There was, of course, the first group, which we looked at two weeks ago, the Judaizers. They were the ones who in the church in Galatia who came in after Paul and were preaching to them another gospel. You recall that Paul said, why are you so quick to go to another gospel? They were the ones that said that, yes, you had um, justification by grace through faith, but you also had to be circumcised. They were adding law to the works of it. And so there are some that think it could have been that. They could have been enemies of the cross because the reality is if you are adding anything, if you're adding works to, to your salvation, then it's going against what Jesus had done. It goes against what Paul says in Galatians, Galatians 2.21. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. If I can earn my righteousness by adhering to all the different laws, then why did Jesus come? Of course, we know why he came, because we can't do that. He came and he didn't abolish the law, he fulfilled the law. The Judaizers, their end is destruction. Why is that? Because they're trusting in self. They've got confidence in the flesh. They're trusting in what they're doing as opposed to faith in Jesus. They're ignoring when Jesus called out on the cross, it is finished. When Jesus said that, that means exactly that. The debt had been paid, the wages of sin had been taken care of. And yet those who add works to it, they're adding to it. And then it says there, their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. Now, as I said, that confused me. I remember looking at it going, what on earth is that talking about? But it's really talking about the physical sense. They put emphasis on themselves. If we're thinking about the Judaizers, those who adhered to not only circumcision, but also the strict customs and dietary laws at the time, they came in and they said, hey, you need to do this and do that. And you'll recall, if you know, through the book of Acts and the Council of Jerusalem, this was a big thing. Suddenly, Christians were saying, well, do I need to adhere to this? What do I need to do? Jesus, when he was calling out the Pharisees, he said that on the outside they were clean, but on the inside they were dirty. He called them whitewashed tombs full of dead man's bones. So their God is their belly. They focus on themselves. And it says whose glory is shame. And that's pretty straightforward because the things that they trusted in, when they see the return of Lord Jesus, suddenly it will be worthless. 
Again, that scripture that haunts me, Lord, Lord, I did this in your name, I did that in your name, and he will say, depart from me, I never knew you, you sons of lawlessness. So whose glory is shame. So you've got on one side, think about the political scale, you've got on one side the Judaizers, the ones with the law. And then you've got on the other side the ones that just reject the law completely. This is another group who they think he could have been talking about, those who are very liberal with the gospel, who played fast and loose, who said, yeah, there's grace, but then it doesn't matter, who take the call for obedience and they forget about it. It's known as antinomial, antinomianism. Antinomialism. I'm sure someone will correct me about that later on. But this is a thing which is alive then and was alive today, and I found a very helpful definition. One guy from the Gospel Coalition simply called it convictionless Christianity. So you've got steep legalism on one hand, then you've got, hey, let's do whatever we want on the other hand. It sees repentance as a single event not to be repeated. Walk the aisle and then just wait for heaven. Sermons are no longer expose our sins, allowing us to admit our faults and confess them freely. The Christian life is more about ignoring sin and resting on a foggy concept of grace. So this is the other thing, and this is who a lot of people think Paul was talking about, that once they accepted or once in their minds they became a Christian, there was nothing else they had to do. Of course, we know that salvation is by grace through faith, but we also know that our works are evidence of that faith being genuine. They are enemies of the cross. I can go back to there. They're enemies on the cross because they deny that there is a change that occurs. There is a change that occurs when the Holy Spirit dwells in someone. In, in Romans 6, Paul answers that question. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. That's the attitude of saying, well, I'm just going to sin and I'll just, you know, at the end of the day, I'll, I'll repent because, hey, God's got this and it's all good. It's kind of like the person that says that I'll get right with God on my deathbed, thinking they'll have a nice long life of 80, 90 or 100 years and die peacefully surrounded by friends. There are Christians out there who have this mentality, and I, I use the word Christian in inverted commas, but they're not the biblical genuine type. They think that they can just do whatever they want and there is no change. He says their end is destruction. Of course, we know why, because you have to really question the genuineness of their original faith. And this isn't a judgment in the sense of saying you're better, but it's recognising and it's the accountability, just like Paul is doing. Biblical repentance isn't just a change of mind, but it's about being born again. It's a change of a desire. It's not only just a turning from sin, but you no longer desire to do that sin. If someone becomes a Christian on a Sunday and nothing changes for the next six months, then it's not a genuine profession. 1 John says, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him, who begot also, loves him who is begotten of him. For by this we know that the love of children of God, when we love God and we keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Now straight away you think, well, I can't keep all the commandments. And of course, that's the point. John continues, For whoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is a very victory he has overcome the world, our faith. He who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So the point is very simple, that when you become a Christian, there is a change. And this other group of people that came in, they could have been new believers, they could have been liberal in, in the way in which they didn't really care about what Paul was instructing and saying. They did whatever. It says that their God was their belly. In the sense, they served themselves. They didn't care. They did whatever they wanted with their body, knowing that at the end of the day, I'll just repent and God will forgive me and it's all good. Forgetting what it says, ignoring what Paul says because remember, before this was bound in our Bible, this was a letter sent to the church. Forgetting passages like in 1 Corinthians 6 that say, not walk, not gallop, but flee. It says, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which is God's. They ignore passages like that. It says that their glory will be their shame. I've seen that of people that, that choose certain lifestyles, that deny the clear biblical mandate for, for a change, and then at the end of the day, they'll be put to shame. They abuse the notion of Christian liberty and, the, and they, to do whatever they want. 
And the final part of this, it says whether it's that group or that group, it doesn't matter. The whole aspect is they're focused on earthly things. They're focused on things of this earth. It doesn't matter whether they are the legalists or whether they're the opposite end of the scale. They focus on things of the earth, whereas a Christian is to focus on things of eternity. Now, this is very relevant for us because, as I said, this is around today. It looks in, in, in different certain ways, but there are sadly people that are trusting in their works. There are some, for example, in the Roman Catholic Church that trust in grace plus works to save them. I say some because I don't say all, but there are some who add hold to that. Us Protestants, hey, we're no better because there are some that trust in their church membership or that their grandfather was a Baptist and their dad was a Baptist and therefore I must be a Baptist as well. There are some that worship on a Saturday instead of a Sunday and they uphold the keeping of the Sabbath as something to be proud of and which will save them. And again, it's some and not all. But we need to be thinking about what we're trusting in. I'm not tiring everyone with the same brush. So you've got those that uphold the law and then you've got the other ones as well. Those that go through what's called the seeker-sensitive movement. They ask non-Christians, hey, you're not coming to church, what do you want more of church? And the big thing is, well, I don't like the music, you know, the hymns are a bit old, we just sung 200-year-old hymns, I want some newer hymns. I saw one pastor proudly say that he played ACDC's Highway to Hell during an Easter service. They're, they're, they're taking the liberties that Christians have and they're abusing it. Taking other circular songs and, and, and changing it and just going, oh, it's all good, you know, God says to play music, so that's perfectly fine. I'm not advocating for hymns only, of course, but you see the point. There, there's one side of the spade and then there's other side as well. It comes down to an issue of theology and the way that we're thinking. Paul says that they have this, that they're thinking of earthly things, whether they're serving their body or looking after themselves. But Paul says in verse 20, for, this is a transition, he says, our citizenship, where is it? It's in heaven. Now, that word probably makes more sense now, but particularly to the Philippians. You recall if you can see, see my little, yeah, it works. That's where Philippi is. That was a Roman colony. Rome is all the way over there. Even though they didn't live in Rome, as citizens of that city, they benefited from a lot of the aspects of what it meant to be Roman. So when he says that you are citizens, that's what he was talking about. It's like that we, we're citizens of a country, but we live elsewhere. It's the same thing if you're an Australian, you go overseas, you've got access and you've got certain privileges because you are an Australian. It's the same thing. We have passports. As an Australian, you have an Australian passport and your name is stamped on that passport. As a Christian, our names aren't stamped on a passport to heaven, but it's stamped in the Lamb's Book of Life. And so Paul knew this, and this is something that he used. You recall that he used his Roman citizenship when it worked for him in a good way. But he says that we are citizens of heaven. And what's a, one byproduct? There's a lot, but there's one byproduct. What does he say? We eagerly await for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. We eagerly await. We wait patiently but expectantly. One Bible talked about the Greek in the sense of someone straining their neck, you know, looking forward and looking around and, and ready. Is it coming? Is it coming? I'm done with this. Let's go. Let's just be done with this sin. I want to be in heaven with you. I read that and the question that I think and the question for us is, do you eagerly await the Saviour's return? I didn't for a very long time until I truly understood that I can't save myself. I never understood those that long for that. I didn't for a very long time and then suddenly I couldn't tell the exact time, but I now eagerly wait the Lord's return. So much so there was once, a Bible, we were doing a Bible study a couple of years ago and we're looking at the book of Revelation and we're studying it indefinitely. Now, if you've read Revelation, it's all about, of course, the return of Jesus and, and all that sort of stuff. And this is when we're living in the manse and at night time, there's trains that go by. You can hear them at the train tracks down there. And I guess it's got to do with the way the wind gets carried or what have you. But you can hear the, the, the tooting of the horn. They must toot the horn before they get to the station. But I remember particularly one Thursday night, we'd just done Bible study, and then I was asleep, and suddenly I hear this blaring, what I thought was a trumpet, this blaring trumpet sound, and we'd just been talking about the rapture, and we'd just been talking about the return of the Lord. I remember waking up, and I, I was terrified and excited at the same time. I thought, yes, he's coming, let's go. And I sat up in bed, and I realized it was a train going past, and I, I was disappointed, and then I went back to sleep. But this is the expectation. It says that we eagerly wait. We eagerly wait. 
Another byproduct of that is we know that everything, all this stuff, isn't going to be here one day. I went to the tip the other day. I was, I was amazed about all the cars, particularly. You look at cars. Cars are expensive. I thought, okay, there was 30 cars there. Someone went into debt to get that car 10 years ago. Now it's sitting in the rubbish heap. There's a great Colin Buchanan song that talks about that, that none of this stuff lasts. We've got to focus on what's eternal. When you live in the light of eternity, when you're eagerly waiting for the Saviour, it changes the way you do things. C.S. Lewis had a great quote. Everything that is not eternal is worthless in eternity. So in light of the imminent return of the Lord, we need to think about eternity. We need to be reminded that our citizenship is in heaven. When you think of these things, it changes. How do you spend your time? How do you spend your time with people? As a parent, are you discipling and bringing up your children in the training of the Lord, as it says in the scripture? Is that a priority for you? What are you spending your time on? As Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It changes the way you spend your time and your talents and then your money. And Paul continues, as a citizen in heaven, what's going to occur? He says in verse 21, he says, Jesus who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. This is talking about the resurrection body. And it's very tempting to get into and think, well, what is it going to be like? What are we going to look like? And I don't care because I'm just going to be there and I know that whatever it's going to look like, it's perfect because God designed it and I'm just happy to be there. But when we look at that, we have to remember that our citizenship is in heaven and therefore when our lowly body, it's talking about our body that is easily broken, this thing is easily broken, that suffers disease. And if it doesn't suffer disease, it causes hurt and pain. I can't tell you the amount of pain and hurt I've caused by my tongue with my words. Our bodies are very capable and quick to sin. But when he returns, we will be transformed and we'll have a glorious body one that doesn't sin, we will be perfected. Steve Lawson says that we will be enabled to worship and serve Christ through all eternity and never grow weary in our new eternal occupation in the country we call home. In that final state, our worship will be made perfect. Another good quote. Scripture repeatedly makes clear that heaven is a realm of unsurpassed joy, unfolding glory, undiminished bliss, unlimited delights and unending pleasures. Nothing about it can possibly have been boring or humdrum. It will be perfect existence. We will have unbroken fellowship with all of heaven's inhabitants. Life there will be devoid of any sorrows, cares, t uh, tears, fears or pain. I believe that was from MacArthur. So this is our hope. This is what we look towards. And how is this possible? Paul says at the end of that verse, he says, according to us, no, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Every single aspect of our salvation is from the Lord. You hear this term, lordship salvation, it's saying that everything, we talk about it in three tenses, the justification. So the original pardoning, when you confess and you repent and you place your trust in Jesus, and then you are no longer under the wrath of God. That justification is a gift of God. By grace, you've been saved through faith. Your sanctification, when the Holy Spirit works in you and it's a change, and no longer you want to be like the world and you desire and you strive to be changing and the Lord works in you so you can work out your salvation. That is a work of the Lord. And then the final tense, the one that we're all waiting for eagerly is the glorification the time when there will be no more sin, and when we will be with our Creator, praising Him for all eternity. Everything of our salvation is from the Lord, and it says there He will subdue something. To subdue means to arrange it in a rank. It gives the indication of putting it back in the way it should have been before sin. Warren Wiseby says, Our values are twisted. Consequently, our vigour is wasted on useless activities and our vision is clouded so that, we, so that the return of Christ is not a real motivating power in our lives. We need to be looking towards this. And then Paul finishes, and I wasn't going to include this in this sermon, but I thought it would be helpful. It doesn't matter where we put it. But Paul says that the next part in, in verse 1 of chapter 4, he says, Therefore, my beloved and longed-for brethren, my joy and my crown, so stand fast in the Lord. 
Stand fast. This is what we're hoping for. Stand fast and hope in the Lord. We must have eternally fixed on our brains. If you're a Christian here, you are not of this world. Someone once said that we are homesick to a world we've never been to or a home that we've never been to. We have this body that's breaking down and decaying, yet we're told we will be given a new body. I've met people and, and heard about people that are in physical disabilities and that gives them more hope because they say, you know, I've got this body, but I can't wait because I'm going to have a new body. Joni Erickson Tata talks about that. We have a new body. This verse tells us to fix our mind and to hope in Jesus. And in a moment, we're going to sing the hymn One Day. And it says, One day the trumpet will sound for his coming. One day the skies with his glories will shine. Wonderful day, my beloved one's bringing. Glorious Saviour, this Jesus is mine. This is our hope. We must be longing for that. And I want to close with just reading a familiar passage from First Thessalonians. Paul writes from verse 13, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For, th for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, not a tram, the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And this last part ties in the first part about fellowship and iron sharpening iron. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore commit comfort, sorry, one another with these words. We are citizens of heaven. We have this hope to look forward to. So let's comfort one another with these words. Let's build each other up and remind us not to be people of this earth, but to be people in, of heaven. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we know that you will return one day and, and we long for it. And I pray if there is someone here that isn't longing or isn't sure, Lord, please give them that assurance that you save us and you that with men it is impossible but with you nothing is impossible lord give us a greater desire for your return but help us to live in the light of that knowing that we have a, a role to do while we wait for you help us to be wise in our time and our talents and what we do so that we can uh, work and place ourselves in the light of eternity help us to fix our eyes on the things that are above and not the things of this earth and we ask this for the sake of Jesus, our Saviour, whom we long to return. Amen.